It's The Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert in Baltimore. Over 700 social leaders and 135 former rebel fighters have been killed in Colombia since the signing of the peace agreement between the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the FARC, and the government of Colombia in January 2016. This is according to a just-released study by the political movement Marcha Patriotica, or Patriotic March, and the Institute for the Study of Peace Development in De Paz, most of those killed, about 500, were campesino leaders, indigenous leaders, Afro-Colombian leaders, and community leaders. Meanwhile, the Colombian human rights group Somos Defensores reported last month that following after a year of relative calm in 2017, 2018 saw violence against social leaders increase by 44%. And for 2019, violence has so far increased by 66% relative to 2018. Most of these killings have been attributed to right-wing paramilitary forces and to Colombian state security forces. Just last week, the New York Times reported that the military had ordered a doubling of the number of military missions against guerrilla fighters and organized crime. This week, though, the military had to retract that order when it raised questions about possible increases in human rights violations. Joining me now from Cauca, Colombia, where most of this violence actually has been taking place, and to look at the state of violence in Colombia's fragile peace agreement is Manuel Rosenthal. He is a Colombian activist, physician, and practicing surgeon, and has more than 40 years of involvement in grassroots political organizing with youth, indigenous peoples, and urban and rural movements. Thanks again for joining us today, Manuel. Thank you, Greg, and thank you for the interest. So let's start with, a, um, with looking at uh, the very dramatic increase in killings of social leaders over the past two years. Why has this increase been happening? What are the factors for it? Uh, the obvious is uh, that it, it, the first thing one has to ask is who would benefit from these killings and who would be capable of doing them. If you look at the same report, you'd see that the entire geography of Colombia is covered and that very specifically, leaders of social movements, organizations, men and women throughout the country who are defending the territories and resources from transnational corporate extractive industries have been targeted. Now, who has the capacity capacity to target everybody everywhere so specifically and so sharply once FARC is removed from the picture? And the answer is obvious. The answer is only the Colombian intelligence and armed forces can do it. What for? Well, specifically because those resources and territories are of interest to investors and transnational corporations. So the war with FARC may be over but the war against Mother Earth and the people of Colombia is not over. In fact, it's increasing. That's what the reports are showing. Now, FARC leader Ivan Marquez has recently come out expressing regret that the FARC disarmed. And since then, uh, it's basically saying that uh, there have been so many unfulfilled elements of the peace agreement and so much violence against former FARC fighters. What, uh, for you, are some of the most important aspects of the peace agreement that the government of President Ivan Duque has left unfulfilled? Everything. The government of, of Iran Duque has clearly stated and his political party and former President Uribe, who is the president of Colombia, have stated that they would dismantle and destroy the peace agreement and they have proceeded to do that, even though they keep repeating they're in favor of peace. Uh, in fact, the, uh, uh, President Duque has tried to transform the peace agreement as a rendition by FARC. They have given up their arms, they have, they're the criminals, and the government of Colombia, the other side of the war, and the worst side by every account, is actually to be treated as the generous uh, uh, side that, that gave the bandit an opportunity. So they haven't kept any part of the agreement. There are assassinations of FARC members throughout the country. There are not, no part of the peace agreement has been kept seriously. And even those who arrived at the Congress are treated as bandits all the time. So no, no, this is the peace agreement between FARC and the government has not been kept. And it was always, in the, to begin with, a poor agreement anyway. 
So, and one of, and this is kind of something that speaks to what you just mentioned, one of the main peace negotiators, known as uh, Jesus Santrich, uh, was arrested for drug trafficking last year under an order from a U.S. court. Now, since then, he has been released, uh, actually very recently, on a Colombian court order, which said that there's not enough evidence to hold him. Tell us a bit about his case. Uh, how is it uh, emblematic of what's going on? And does it give hope uh, that Colombia's judicial system, at the very least, is acting independently of political pressures? Yes, uh, the first thing what I, what I must tell people there who are far away from here is that President Duque yesterday called Santrich being released by the highest court in the country. He called him, he is a mafioso, he's a member of the mafia. So President Duque is above the law. He, does, he ignores the law. So this is what's behind this case. Santrich is accused with a, with a manipulation as being a drug trafficker. There are no proofs against him. The U.S. <clears throat> requires him in extradition. Uh, he is not extradited uh, and then he's found no, not guilty by the highest courts, but the government wants to find him guilty. And uh, it, it is emblematic because there are no proofs against Santrich. He has not gone due process. On the other hand, if anyone, if anyone can be prosecuted with sufficient evidence in the U.S. and in Colombia for drug trafficking, it's actually uh, President Duque's boss, Álvaro Uribe Vélez. So what's going on here is actually President Duque is, is trying to achieve immunity for for President Uribe for the very crimes he's accusing Santrich of. But it didn't work. Uh, he, uh, President Duque had to back off. The highest court in Colombia stopped the uh, extradition and released Santrich from jail. But it is most likely in the US where you'll find the answer for this. It's a hypothesis, but the most possible one. You mentioned the New York Times piece. In the New York Times piece, I think, had a major influence on this decision. The government of Colombia, the highest official of the Colombian armed forces, were all exposed as a fascist regime. Orders to assassinate everywhere, orders for Im immunity and impunity for government officials and army commanders killing people, and orders to uh, destroy social movements everywhere. Duque's a plan, and Uribe's plan was openly a state of siege. Take over the judiciary, take over the, the uh, Congress, shut them down on the excuse of Santrich's case and another jurisdiction for peace. And doing that, doing a, a coup was their plan, and then giving the army commanders all the power to attack people everywhere. They had to back off. And one of the main reasons is that this is not a scandal in Colombia, about which they don't care. But it is a scandal now in the United States after the New York Times article came out. The change in position of President Duque, the release of Santrich, happened almost immediately after it was known in the U.S. that the fascist regime at the service of the U.S. is a exposed to the U.S. public. So it does play a major role, in my view. So that brings me to a related question. What exactly has been the role of the Trump administration in the peace process and the increase in violence? The, the uh, Trump administration has not respected any component of the peace agreement and has put pressure on uh, President Duque and the government of Colombia to break down the peace agreement. And the most visible component of that pressure is actually the war on drugs. One key component of the five-point peace agreement with FARC was a substitution of uh, uh, coca uh, cultivations uh, peacefully. And then the Trump administration had dem has demanded war. They have started again glyphosate uh, use. They have started again militarization of territories. They have started an all-out war 
against the, the coca production in spite of the fact that people were actually trying to dismantle the drug production. So there's a militarization of the country everywhere. There's support for the armed forces and actually the intent on uh, entering Venezuela potentially with a, a, an all-out American war, South American and North American war, uh, has in increase the pressure from the U.S. over the Colombian military options. Following Rumsfeld model, following the model that was established of a corporate army in the U.S., all armies in Latin America, and particularly the Colombian army, is a corporate army. In other words, it profits financially from war, and it sells its services to different actors be it transnational corporations or be it drug, traffic or drug trafficking cartels or others. So what is being exposed now is a massive corruption of the armed forces that makes money from killing people. And this model of assassination for profit is actually the main influence of the U.S. on Colombia. We cannot have peace here because we have corporations, including the army, working for profit in every regard and a mafia type state and country mm. okay well unfortunately we're going to have to leave it there for now but we'll come back to you soon as uh, the situation develops i was speaking to manuel rosenta colombian activist physician and practicing surgeon based in cauca colombia thanks again manuel for having joined us today and keep safe thank you very much take care with and thank you for joining the real news network